get things started. Hey guys, how to be here. Mario, Mario, Mario. <laughs> Wait, that's a, that's a, that's a little too cliche. <clears throat> the Japanese created Italian plumber from Brooklyn has certainly made a name for himself for not only being the pinnacle of video game platformers, but being the face of an entire entertainment market as a whole, whether you want to believe that or not. For myself, my video game career got started alongside Mario, with things like Super Mario Bros. 3, Super Mario World, and Super Mario 64. Though, with 64, it, it didn't really blow my load like a lot of other people would describe it at the time, since at the ripe age of 5, I never really had the mindset of picking a specific genre, character, or hardware in general that was just, like, my thing. I never really thought like that. Plus, at 5 years old, I probably wouldn't know what blow my load would have meant. Probably. But speaking of genres, that's the other side of this conversation, that being RPGs. Now growing up, I played a lot of Pokemon, like a butt ton of it. But other than that, I never really dabbled too much into it. However, there was Mario games that did go into the RPG scene, initially starting with Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. One that I didn't play until much later, but ones that I did, however, were his Paper Mario series, the topic of today's video. Now, the first one when I played it, that was just, just a huge ride going through the entire thing, since the file that I got, the copy of the game I got, had a file right at the very end of the game against the fight with Bowser, and then there was another save file that was right at Tubba Blubba's house, so that was... <laughs> that was quite an enticing thing. It was a really neat sneak peek at the kinds of things that we were going to be getting into. But that's for a different video later on. Rather, when I heard that the sequel was coming out, I got pretty excited and really wanted to play it. But there was one big problem with that, and that was I never had a GameCube growing up. Now, besides handhelds, my house kind of became home to mostly Sony products, so I never really had a reliable means of playing anything like that at least until the Wii had come out, and that was huh, that was one hectic holiday season when that first got released. Ooh boy, that was nuts. And of course, as many of you know, the Wii was actually backwards compatible with GameCube games, so that really helped give me a chance to try to experience it. Now, I had a neighbor, a uh, good friend of mine next door that actually had the Thousand Year Door and a GameCube controller as well, but with no reliable means of playing it himself either, at least until the Wii had come out. So when finally it did, and we both got one, and after a little bit of time, I asked, you know, if I could borrow it to play around with it a little bit and see what it was all like. And he said yes, so I took it home and played it. Oh boy, that was, that was quite the ride. <laughs> to wrap this intro up real quick, because I know it's starting to get a little long, but anyways. Uh, recently, I've been trying to collect a lot of these older GameCube games that I missed out on when I was younger, obviously spearheaded by Path of Radiance. I'll get to that one eventually, but anyways. With a Thousand Year Door, I actually found a copy at a local pawn shop, and I decided to try to get it from there. However, when I opened it up and to check out the disc, it was, like, heavily scratched, like, almost unbelievably so. I'll try to put a picture up, but anyways. And, but the person behind the counter said, oh yeah, no, the person who sold it to me, they, they ensure that this thing works. No, it didn't. That was a waste of money right there. Fortunately though, I did manage to find a copy of just a disc on eBay, and since I already had the case from the, the pawn shop, I didn't really need to get that. So, I finally now have it back into my collection. So, without further ado, and it's long intro out of the way, let's dive right in and take a look at Paper Mario A Thousand Year Door. So in an intro cutscene before the game starts, we see Princess Peach hanging out in a slum-like port city called Rogueport. 
She comes across a vendor who offers her the chance to open a box that can normally only open for a pure-hearted individual, allowing her to take what was inside. Later on, when actually starting the game, we learn Peach has sent the contents of the box, a treasure map, to Mario and has told him to meet her in Rogueport. Upon making landfall there, he is immediately thrusted into a confrontation against his bulking character, who is part of a group called the x Knots, and his group of minions that... Uh, I don't even really know what they are. They're humanoid enough, but are just so weird in shape. I just... I don't know. Regardless, Mario assists a female Goomba being harassed by them, and they make their escape amongst the chaos. The Goomba introduces herself as Goombella, and notices Mario's map, and says that she and her mentor, Professor Frankly, can probably help with it. Just then, Toadsworth appears and tells Mario that Peach has been missing for some time and that he's now starting to get worried. After talking with Professor Frankly and exploring the sewers beneath Rogueport, Mario ends up coming upon the Thousand Year Door, with his map reacting to it, signaling where a crystal star and a very important item to the door is being held, with Mario and Gubella promptly heading that way towards adventure. And with that, your journey truly begins. Recruit a colorful cast of characters, explore the paper-inspired 3D world, if that makes any sense to you, hone your battling and performing skills, and discover the secrets behind the x knots the Thousand-Year Door, and how Peach is involved with all of it. Now, Mario games aren't really known for their story, RPGs included, but the Thousand-Year Door has some really good secondary and subplots that I find complement the main one really well. It's quite enjoyable. Unlike regular Mario games where worlds are comprised of forest land, desert land, water land, yada yada yada, the Thousand Year Doors world are set more based upon genres in movies or stage plays to match the aesthetic it achieves during battle. You have the harrowing fantasy in Chapter 1, the sports drama of Glitzville, the horror thriller style of Twilight Town, a swashbuckling treasure hunt in Chapter 5, a detective story on a high-speed train, a sci-fi adventure to the moon, and even a sort of monster of the week kind of story to round out the end of the game. I can't quite tell you what the puny story is about other than the black and white underdog story? I don't know. Regardless, each story and every character tied to these are all unique in their own regard and play off of the trope it exhibits really well. And let me just say that even if you don't like the overall story, which is a fair position to take, you can't deny the overall comedic writing of this game. <laughs> it's, it's so smart and it's such an enjoyable time at almost every turn. And since Mario is a mute, minus a few wahoos, his partners pick up the slack and they're all extremely charming in their own regard, bringing up different points and observations that may be more relevant to them while still achieving a decent flowing narrative regardless of who you have out at the time. Now I said before that I really wish that games would take better advantage of the hardware that it's making and instead of making super hyper realistic graphics all the time make something that'll that'll last that'll last to the end of time now the best modern example i can give so far is probably something like persona 5 that game looks fantastic and it will continue to do so many years down the line but probably one of my earliest examples that i can give for something like this would be the thousand year door the game looks fantastic even for a game that's come out in 2004. The art style for it is very smart and plays with all its things really well. And like I said, the aesthetic behind it is played with very well. Like with stuff like you can be a paper airplane or paper boat in order to traverse. You can use flurry to blow away scraps of paper to uncover secret areas and many more stuff like that. It plays with it really well. It's very smart with it and makes it enjoyable even today. Now, if I was to criticize it even a little bit, though, it's the fact that you're essentially using 2D sprites in an open 3D space and trying to gauge the proper landing spaces for stuff, especially along like the Y-axis or whatever. It does get a little awkward to try to judge every now and again, but you get used to it and it still does look really nice. And while this game's music isn't what I would consider legendary, it has some really neat tracks. Rogueport's theme, Excess Express, is very fitting for its setting, as well as Chapter 8's theme being just an intense theme, plain and simple. But now on to gameplay. 
Paper Mario has the very distinct theme of having health for both friend and foe, only being in double digits, with most attacks only chipping away with single digit damage, unless you get a very specific setup with Mega Rush badges and are good with super bounces. Now to some, that kind of health may seem a little too simplified, and admittedly, it sort of is. I certainly never had much of a problem with most of these fights. But the change in numbers isn't that far apart if you were to scale things appropriately. Say one boss in Mario has 60 health, a boss of equal stature in, say, Final Fantasy would have somewhere as upwards of like three to 4,000, maybe more. As well, there's an insane amount of customization within the core mechanics that certainly helps set things apart from other RPGs. But before that, so you encounter an enemy in the overworld, if you can jump on top of, hammer, or use a partner character's ability on an enemy beforehand, you can enter the fight with a free strike. Though enemies can do the same, so you have to be careful. You enter in the fight and have a choice of a variety of options for Mario. You can jump, hammer, use a special attack that consumes flower power or MP for comparison, use star power if you have any to perform a unique skill, use an item, or run. Sounds somewhat simplified as I said, but you can further augment this by equipping badges onto Mario. Badges do a variety of things for Mario, like giving him special attacks that require FP to use, uh, boosting his or his partner's stats up a little bit, or allowing his health and FP to refill over the course of a fight. And that's where the true fun for this game really comes in, is the insane customization that you can give to Mario. How one person plays the game will be completely different to how someone else will want to play it, and that's where things get really interesting. So with these badges equipped, when you pick an attack, it does a set amount of damage, but you can further augment that by succeeding in the action commands. Holding the stick back to time it out with a more powerful hammer strike, or timing the A button while jumping to perform an extra jump. Hitting these are basically required and can definitely get you a little riled up if you miss some, though if it's your first time playing or if it's been a while, the button timing on jumps is a little wonky, so it's forgivable, you'll, you'll get used to it. When performing these, at certain points of an attack, you can time the A button well, you can also perform a stylish move. These aren't just for show, since performing one will get you more star energy from the crowd, allowing you to do more skills with them. Some of these can be really easy to do, like with after a hammer strike, or super annoying, like trying to nail that first stylish move in the middle of jumps. Before continuing, the battles are played out like they are on a stage, with a set and a crowd and, and everything. In early levels, this doesn't affect much, though the more levels you get, the bigger the stage and crowd will become, causing different things to happen. Crowd members can throw objects, good or bad, at you, or parts of the set will interact with either Mario or his enemy, good or bad as well, though it's usually bad, at least for me. I've had a lot of bad situations. Also, Mario and company can utilize items in battle, things like mushrooms and syrups for health and FP restoration respectively, different damaging items or defensive items as well. The thing about the early game though is that I never really needed to use many items, at least of the restorative variety. If you're good with your stylish commands and pace your sweet treat star power, or later on sweet feast, there's very little need for items for the most part. Late game, things can sort of get dicey, but it's usually manageable. Now, you can let Mario perform an action first, and after he does, or if you want, you can swap to your partner character to let them perform an action. They don't get new attacks like Mario does from badges. They get a base setup of health and attacks that can be further improved with collectible shine sprites that you can give to Merlin. But aside from that, each party member is very unique in their own regard. Goombella does jump attacks similar to Mario and can observe enemies pointing out weaknesses and showing their health bars. Koops attacks in similar ways to Mario's hammer, only being able to strike grounded foes, but he also has a natural plus one to his defense. Flurry can automatically end fights by using a gust of wind to send enemies flying from the fight. Oh, sweet Yoshi. The first time I played, I actually ended up getting a black Yoshi, and black Yoshis look really cool. I really like the coloring for them. I wonder what I'll get this time. Maybe another black one, or maybe a blue one. It kind of kind of match my shirt a little bit. I, I wonder what it'll be.
that crap. Yoshi can negate enemy defenses by swallowing them and spitting them out, potentially hitting others behind them. Vivian can hide Mario from powerful attacks and can hit enemies with damage over time effects. Bobbery's attacks with the highest output out of everyone and can also hit everyone on screen. And finally, an optional character, Miss Mouse can steal items from enemies. Needless to say, everyone has their uses, but my favorites were always Goombella for the tattles, Bobbery for the bombs, and Vivian to incinerate all those in her way. And to look precious to boot. Anywho, your partner's attacks work the same as Mario's, and when both attack, then your opponents do theirs. And just like with attacking, you can perform action commands at just the right time to lower the damage you take from enemies. Optionally though, if you have very good timing, you can press B while defending to perform super guards, negating all damage the enemy is doing, and if they make contact while doing so, counterattack for one point of damage. This can be extremely game breaking, but only the best of the best can pull this off consistently. And that's about it for the combat. After the enemy does their attack, everything repeats until someone drops. There's no speed stat involved or anything like that. As well, in this game at least, your partner has health like Mario, though your game doesn't end if they go down, only if Mario goes down. Meaning that if you want to play really safe, you can stick your partner in front for a higher chance of them taking most of the damage. So, yeah, it's kind of simple, but very customizable, which is great. But of course, it is a Mario game, so there's overworld movement and even some platforming involved. There's nothing much to say just in general. There are shops to visit to buy items, blocks to get coins and special badges, star pieces and shine sprites to collect, and inns to sleep in. But what's neat though is, like I had mentioned earlier, at different points Mario can change forms to allow for unique travel around the world, as well as having some of his teammates being able to do stuff as well. Koops can collect items and hit switches from a distance, Flurry can blow down loose paper, Yoshi can hover over small gaps, Vivian can hide Mario from obstacles, and Bobbery can pilot a boat. Uh, and I guess he can blow stuff up too, I suppose, I guess he is a bomb. It gives the game a sort of Metroidvania effect alongside its typical RPG routine, breathing in fresh life to backtracking, which is kind of important since you will backtrack a number of times in this game, mostly for things like troubles. Troubles are basically the game's side quests, which I kind of like. They're all confined to one location where you're ready to do them. You find out where the person is and you go there. Each trouble has you doing a variety of things, but are mostly there to be further helpful to Mario in the end. A toad named Zesty can cook items for Mario, but if you help her with her trouble, then she can cook two things at once, making very powerful items. Doing troubles is how you're able to recruit Miss Mouse to the party, and so on and so on. The only small snippet is that you can only do one trouble at a time, but that's not a huge issue. After you're done with Chapter 3, you can go back to the Glitz Pit to take on all challengers and take the Great Gonzales back to the top, which is a bunch of fights with unique win conditions throughout. Or if you want just a bare bones fighting challenge that'll test your patience, you can take on the Pit of 100 Trials. 100 consistent fights with prizes scattered all throughout, ending with a unique boss fight. And finally, in between chapters, you actually take control of Peach and Bowser in their own little segments. Bowser has a lot less, but when you actually do stuff with him, it's a fun callback to the original Mario games where you try to go through little stages and get to the flagpole at the end. Peaches are less fun like that, but allow for her and the x knots thirsty computer tech to give out bits of exposition in a unique sort of fashion that is always a good time. And even after beating the game, it throws you right back in to finish up any leftover things you might have missed, and to even show off some special post-game stuff as well, which I can respect. This game, man, this game is so much fun. <laughs> Remember in Chapter 4 when Dupla stole Mar Mario's identity and he had to go through the rest of the chapters just him, and a little bit later on with Vivian as well? <laughs> 
everyone hated that chapter. I really enjoyed it. I found it very charming, and just the the idea around the chapter was just so so spooky, and it was something that you don't really see too often. And Vivian, uh, Vivian is just so dang adorable. Like, why why couldn't you just like her? <laughs> or what about when you're doing the glitz pit and you end up finding King K in the storage room, nearly dead? Like, whew, that was a quite a spooky revelation and really set the tone for the rest of the chapter. I thought it was really neat. Ah, this game is just so awesome. It's so creative. And it's a solid entry and was basically the trilogy of Paper Mario games. I mean, sure, he made a later appearance with Mario and Luigi, but really, it's just the solid trilogy that he's had. It's just a shame that Nintendo hasn't really brought Paper Mario back in any sort of really good fashion. Nope, it's just... It's just been these three games that he's really started. It's not like they would put him in involving stickers or paint or anything like that. Pfft, no, just three solid games. No, no, bad. I said three, bad. Three games. But anywho, thank you all so much for watching. If you like what you saw, you can click right up here to check out some of my other videos. Or, if you really feel like it, you can click right up here to subscribe. And until next time, guys, I will see you all later.